Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching today. Uh, this is a video series where I talk to other SEO professionals, product professionals about the different aspects that we handle on a day-to-day -day basis. Today we are going to talk about data, how important it is in our day-to-day -day work um, in SEO, product management, project management, etc., etc. And we've got here Marco Giordano, who is a an SEO specialist working in B2C, uh, in the B2C world for B2C content websites. Hello, Marco. How are you? Fine. What about you, Monte? I'm very well. Thank you and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for, for coming on today. So could you perhaps um, say who you are to your audience? Perhaps there might be somebody out there who doesn't know you. Okay. So hi, my name is Marco. I work as an SEO specialist for B2C content websites. So it means publishers, content websites of any type, niche, affiliate, uh, even e-commerce sometimes, as long as they have some content or, you know, they need help with content. And I am also a data analyst as well, mm -hmm. uh, in addition to it. So I mostly work, you know, with the aforementioned websites to analyze their data and to help them build efficient processes. All right. So uh, that is very important in our um, in our industry, right? To be building efficient processes so that we can actually uh, achieve our our end goal. So, um, Marco, what are the benefits of using data in our world? In an awareness of your work, why should we be using data? Okay, so there are many reasons, but the most important would be first of all, usually in our industry. We can say that there is a lot of smoke. Uh, I mean that a lot of case studies, a lot of evidence isn't really solid. Now, it's not very solid or consistent. So knowing even the basics, the foundations of something, it's better to safeguard ourselves against, we can say, snake oil. Okay. So this would be the first use. Knowing what to present, what to report, how to do it, and how to work with data is more important than other topics because at the end of the day, if you get something wrong there, it's a big problem for everyone, even for your clients, for yourself, and so on. The other reason is that, well, a lot of big players, for example, the ones I usually mention, like Red Ventures, Dot Dash Meredith. So mm -hmm. these are two content Goliaths, we can say, one of the <laughs> biggest conglomerates in the, in the world. They actively use data because data, not only SEO data in general, I'm talking and speaking in general, it can also be user data preferences and so on, allow you to essentially get more money because you can do better advertising, which is uh -huh. extremely important. Some of them you can resell. Of course, it depends on the law. And the others you can use for, you know, check your performance, see what's going on, what you can improve and to prevent these disasters. Now, if you notice that some pages are not performing well, you may want to check that immediately. And for big websites, so if you have a medium large website, using, using the usual tricks, it's not enough because it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a necessary measure if you are big enough. Once you get too big, you need to have these systems in place. And in fact, many of, I would say all of them actually, of the 16 or something like that websites, conglomerates, I wanted to say that rule the web in the US, all use these systems if you Google one by one, almost all of them, because some of them don't have information, but I told you the most famous cases are Adventures, Dodge Meredith, and even Vox Media. All of them have some systems to check the performance of their pages. They have proprietary platforms for these data they gather from users, no? Mm -hmm. And they also invest a lot in decision making, because at the end of the day, if you have something like data, you want to turn them into insights, and then eventually you want to take action, doing something. So just to summarize, uh, one of the best uh, ways to uh, make more money through advertising or just make um, informed decisions is by using data, the, the right amount of data or the right type of data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Usually it's a mix of quality and quantity. Mm -hmm. uh, in SEO, 
I mean, SEO data are very limited because mm -hmm. all of the data we have are by default quite inaccurate, even Search Console data to some extent. Yeah. So in our case, it's a little bit more difficult, but it's also easier because, you know, you have less stuff to work with compared to other industries, like, I don't know, finance, to name one. Mm -hmm. So it's easier in a certain sense to add value, but it's also harder because there aren't many resources out there. And in my opinion, you know, some stuff should be done by technical people because some topics are not are not SEO at all, like mm -hmm. UX. They happen to combine with SEO, but they're not SEO. I mean, a UX specialist is different from an SEO. As an SEO, you can also know UX, of course. In addition to it, you can also do it. But mm -hmm. it's only a subset. It's only a minority that actually knows UX in addition to SEO. And the same is with data, which is even more technical. Because at the end, if you talk about data, you often talk about mathematics or statistics. And they are a little bit more technical. So these are the main, you know, issues or things and why knowing a little bit of these topics can help you because you can have the edge as well. So it's not just about the data in, in itself. It's about the, the actual business case, right? The actual yeah. business, um, the business industry, the, the industry where the business is sitting at this moment in time. So yes. obviously the data you're going to get or the business you are going to work in, um, say in finance, is going to be very different from a news publisher or even a news publisher in the uh, finance industry, obviously. Yes. Yes. I mean, the, in, in my opinion, the most striking example is SaaS. Mm -hmm. Because I don't do SaaS, and it's the most different SEO subset, I want to call it, model, compared mm -hmm. to the others. If you take content websites, SaaS, and e-commerce, mm -hmm. I consider them as different jobs. I don't consider them as similar, because we can do completely different things. For instance, in my case, I don't do technical SEO. Mm -hmm. I am specialized in content and other stuff. So when they usually tell you that content websites are only content and links, of course, it's an exaggeration. It's not literal. <laughs> But in, in many cases, it's correct. It's not wrong. It's correct. But if you do e-commerce, I hardly imagine doing e-commerce without starting and doing mostly technical SEO. Taxonomy, your information architecture, and all canonicals and so on. It's very hard. In SaaS, uh, I don't know how to say, like B2B SaaS doesn't even look like pure SEO to me because most of the stuff they do, it's very, very hybrid. It's very hybrid with content marketing, distribution, repurposing. Mm -hmm. You don't see any content distribution or repurposing for a content website. It's not like you don't see it, but it's not as diffused and evolved like in B2B SaaS. Probably because, you know, in B2B, the volume, the demand is not as big as B2C. So probably they have to adapt. But in, if you check for content websites, or even, even if you check in analytics or these industries, ignoring mm -hmm. SEO for a moment, there are key differences between B2C, B2B, and some specific niches. Mm -hmm. Because some of them, like construction and healthcare, are regulated by law. So this is another important difference aspects, that yeah. many don't consider. But It's also true. That's why I don't like the comparisons between like B2B SaaS or, you know, a content website, because they are totally different ways mm -hmm. of doing SEO, even though the goal is the same, but the methods, even though SEO is the same, we can say the methods, the um, some topics have slight variations. Some of those variations are actually quite big. <laughs> you are totally right. Every single yeah. business is different uh, to begin with. So what would you, as, as you very well say, is just looking for those things that make a difference in that business, in yes. that industry niche. And obviously we then, we then apply it to the different websites or different media uh, that we need to use uh, because we might not need to use the same tactics in e-commerce, for example, or in SaaS. Yeah, uh, yeah. so I, I can relate because I have worked in B2B SaaS and those websites are very different. It's lead generation yeah, yeah, yeah. in itself. Yeah, it's, it's, they, are, they are totally different. Although, although you have to say, um, 
certain SaaS websites are a more complicated than others, yes. more complex, no, no complicated, yeah, yeah. more complex. Uh, and so the taxes are totally different. And so the end goal is actually different as well, uh, because it is not the same, you know, asking for yeah. uh, sales yeah as asking for um for a user to buy then just leave data so that we can contact them later that's totally yeah, yeah. complicated don't, don't yeah this different. is exactly what i meant exactly also with data if you need to you know to talk about these models in content websites measuring page views is fine if you're using display ads or sessions or whatever it's uh -huh. fine it's acceptable no because at the end that's the more traffic you have in theory the more you make, in theory, no? Mm -hmm. It's good. In B2B SaaS, you would use other metrics like SQL, MQL, and so on, your leads, as you said. But also other metrics I probably don't know, like the number of synapses, downloads, and so on. But in other cases, these metrics are not suitable because, you know, either you don't have them, like you, you, have, you don't have to generate leads, you just mm -hmm. sell or you, you don't sell, you just have ads or affiliate, and you have to track different things. And this, I know this sounds obvious, but many get this wrong because I think that one of the problems of the SEO industry, mm -hmm. uh, the most common example is niche websites and uh, how do you call it, normal or other types of SEO websites like SaaS, is that there is miscommunication because they are totally different models of websites. So people say, how can they say technical SEO is not important? And vice versa. But in mm -hmm. practice, they are different priorities because yeah. if I have a new website, like a blog in WordPress, I'm, let's say I'm a travel blogger, my priority number one is content and links. It's very hard to get technical SEO wrong in WordPress. Very, 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 you have to put some effort. But if you do an e-commerce, even from scratch, the first thing I would do would be the taxonomy and technical SEO, of course, and more focus on some details that in other websites you wouldn't care about. In SaaS, as well, you would have the comparison pages, alternatives, mm -hmm. and some specific elements that are typical of SaaS. And the same is with data. For the most basic example is analytics. Google Analytics, I don't use it much. Like, I barely use analytics for one reason. If you have a content website, or if you deal with these types of websites, uh, you know, I deal with, like publishers, mm -hmm. and they ask me, we have a problem. Like we have to find which pages are losing traffic or we have to find what's happening. And they only ask me for organic traffic, which is what usually happens. Uh -huh. It's quite simple. You need search console. And even so, if you need analytics, you only need the most basic metrics like users, sessions. So it's kind of easy. It's not like no, I know Google, knowing Google Analytics in depth. It's only knowing how to extract the most basic metrics. The, or the, the data, metrics. the no. data you actually need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's very simple. Indeed, I'm not an expert in Google Analytics 4 in terms of interface. I barely know how to use it. I only know the metrics mm -hmm. and the ideas. No? But Search Console, I know everything because it's my, mo it's my most used tools, tool uh, for extracting metrics and for understanding what's happening. So in this case, it's acceptable to say something like this. But if you work in e-commerce or SaaS, I think you have to know analytics, because you, you want to track a lot of additional stuff in Tag Manager, analytics, whatever, that is very important. Like mm -hmm. if someone is clicking on a specific link, the, um, how many people leave the cart, abandon the cart, no, the percentage, what's happening, the engagement, and so on. These metrics are still important, we can say, in a lot of web, other websites, mm -hmm. but are less important no, compared to e-commerce. Of course, the product card abandon, abandonment rate is super important. As well in SaaS, you want to know the journey of the users or yeah. what's happening. And you probably want to analyze sales data or additional data because SEO data is not enough, in my opinion, in B2B SaaS. You need sales data or data from, you know, even from phone calls, the texts, yeah. you want to transcribe that. So even this stuff is very different. And I think this is one of the most common problems in the SEO industry, not only in the SEO industry, mm -hmm. also in other places, like even in the data world, there are super different jobs. Like you can work in healthcare, be a biostatistician, 
and you will never use some tools that other colleagues working in business use daily, like mm -hmm. totally different jobs. But at the end of the day, you're still working with data. Uh, the, the gist is the same. And the same is SEO. You can do e-commerce, you can do SaaS, very different. But at mm -hmm. the end of the day, the goal is the same. No? Yes, no, definitely. Um, in terms of tools, the uh, Google Search Console is one of the most important ones. And I, I do remember when we started talking again about the GSC, because people is that people were actually looking into other tools such as Adobe, such as Google Analytics, and forgetting about the GSC and all the very good data that you could actually get, especially if you could the API, obviously. Yeah. So yeah, I, yeah I never understood okay. this fact. Like, I've never understood why many care more about analytics because usually your first priority is search console and then analytics, in SEO at least. Eh? Right. So what are the top three things, in your opinion, to avoid, for SEOs to avoid in terms of working with data? Okay, the first one, I mean, not in particular order. The first one would be um, not cleaning data. I mean, you have to clean data, uh -huh. okay? Absolutely. I agree. You, you have to avoid not cleaning data, which means that a lot of people just get data from Search Console and that's it. But you don't do that like that. Usually you have to apply some filters to remove the noise, what's not useful. Examples, branded keywords. The most famous example, branded keywords, because usually you want to separate them, to track them separately. Mm -hmm. Then you want to remove foreign queries, especially in, in for American websites, you get a lot of queries, much more compared to other countries, like Italy, for instance. Uh, yeah, and so what's important is that you have to remove foreign queries. Sometimes when you use the API, you get queries in Japanese or Arabic. I don't know why. It happens. You can filter them out. You can also filter those pages that are not relevant. Like, why should we ever track in Search Console about us? It's not getting organic traffic. It's mostly non-branded organic traffic. It's mostly, you know, for analytics, if you want to check direct traffic or something else. So usually tag categories. In most cases, people no index them. So you can, or they're not really no index. They are indexed, but they don't get traffic. So a lot of these pages create noise, especially for big websites, and you can remove them. So the important is understanding that some stuff is noise. You don't actually need to measure it just because it's there. So you just clean your data, remove what's not needed to mm -hmm. improve the, your analysis. And a lot of people I see forget to remove pagination. Or even worse, you know what? Um, jump links, site links or jump links. Because in Search Console, you still get impressions for site links. If you get yeah. site links, you get them in Search Console. But they are useless because they inflate your impressions. They, they don't measure anything at the end. So usually you remove all the parameters, like no hashtag, no uh, af everything after the question mark and so on. You try to remove all of them, mm -hmm. okay? Because they are most often, like 99.9% .9 of the cases, not needed, unless you need particular attention, but you remove what's not needed and only focus on what's useful for the business. The second thing, it's not tying this stuff to business which is why I love data in particular. The problem with SEO, especially in B2B, and that's why I don't like it, because it's harder. I think it's much harder. It's harder sometimes to combine SEO with the business. Because if you have to work for a B2B healthcare something software, unless you know the audience, it's hard as an SEO, because you, know, you have to combine this SEO to business so that they make sense. So that they go together, no? In other cases, we can talk about product-led SEO, right? Mm -hmm. But for other websites, doesn't make much sense. I told you, like if you're a publisher, the only important thing is publishing, publishing, technical SEO. If you're too big, of course, then mm -hmm. you need technical SEO and then publishing again. So in that case, your business is kind of aligned with SEO because in most cases, these websites are alive thanks to SEO. But in other cases, e-commerce and friends, mm -hmm. you need to, 
you know, to tie to business. You can go to an e-commerce and say, let's write this content, even though it's not related to your core offering. Doesn't make any sense. It's not like you're selling more products if it's not related or doesn't cover the pain points of your customer. So this, this is an example, tying what you do to business, data to business. It's very important. This is also relates to what you were saying earlier about choosing the right metrics for your business. Obviously, you're not going to be um, tracking sales, for example, or um, um, I don't know um, some uh, traffic to certain types of um, of pages, or not really paying that much attention to them if you are not in a specific type of business. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Also, because um, I told you, if you have to recommend some SEO changes. Mm -hmm. Usually they should have some motivation. They should be motivated in some way. And the best way to do it, to, to, to do so, is with data. Yeah. Also because there is a bias. People think that data is in, can't fail, which is extremely wrong. But for once, it works out, it works out in our favor. No, for, at, for once at least. <laughs> uh, in SEO, the problem is that um, a lot of stuff we do is very uncertain because we can't make promises, mm -hmm. even forecasts. They are forecasts. They are not the future. And the other problem as well is that even though you try to tie SEO to business, then there is execution. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not always our fault. You know, execution is not always depending on what we recommend. It's not up to us in some cases. And the third error that I usually see is that a lot of tools or a lot of the reporting we see currently ignores the foundations or statistics or this stuff, because I, I will give you an example. Mm -hmm. The most famous example, because uh, they were discussing about it on Twitter yesterday, and they agree with the replies. Average position. Average position in Search Console, it's called position. So it's when you use the API, it's already confusing. Yeah. It's confusion within the confusion. And the problem is that if you don't know how averages work, even though it's a simple, very simple topic, eh? it's, a, it's a school topic, but it's misleading. So Can if be. you don't know the process behind, how does it work? You can make super wrong decisions. And this is a simple example. Now, scale it up. Let's bring this example to something more complex that adds more money. If you have, let's say you have a, a website making 5 million of users per month. Okay, a big, it's a big website, no? Mm -hmm. And you have to do some research. You have to do some analysis, no? To spot what are the pages, the articles, whatever, that are losing tr traffic over time. Now, this is a very common use case. I mean, the solution that some people recommend on Twitter or on social media, the usual good advice, which is very wrong, is to go to the website, to the Search Console interface, mm -hmm. go into pages, do a comparison and comparing them. And this is not wrong. This is not wrong advice. There is nothing wrong here. You see, lose, loss or gain. But there is one conceptual problem that is very important here. Many conceptual problems that can make this client lose money or make super wrong decisions. And some of them listening, I hope they will realize. The first one is that if you compare only two periods, mm -hmm. like A and B, you don't know what happens in the middle. Example, if in January you have 10K page views, no? and in December of the same year, you end up with 20K, you would say, oh, wow, it's an increase. But what if I told you that from February to November, you had 100K? Hmm. Is it still a gain? Is it still good? No, of course not. It's not good. And this is one reason why you can't ignore these mathematical or statistical implications, because then this happens. Another example is seasonality. Hmm. Seasonality, yeah. everyone speaks about it, but seasonality, you know, either you know there is seasonality because you know the business. Like if you sell umbrellas, you probably know that you're not going to send, say, you know, to sell umbrellas in, in the summer, June. It's very unlikely. Or you don't know, which is often the case. Like, how do you know? In some cases, 
people maybe watch out, I don't know, something, or for some reason, they try to buy some good more mm -hmm. than others. And the only way to know it, it's by looking at your data and extracting this seasonality. And this is not a topic that many talk about because it's actually a little bit technical. The same goes with internal links. A lot of people ignore that, you know, internal links are links in general, even backlinks, as you mm -hmm. know, are not equal. No. But many people ignore that. Backlinks is the prime example. So if you have one backlink from, you know, from a very good website, mm -hmm. they don't usually link to other websites. They only link to a minority of websites and you happen to be in them and it's related, it's worth more. If you get 100K mediocre unrelated backlinks, they're probably not much worth because they, they don't follow a linear, we can say, process. It's not like the more backlinks you have, the better your rankings are. No, of course not. And they can Absolutely even be not. harmful to, to your business as well, to your website. Yes. So you have to be very yes. careful of that. Yes, okay. yes. Oh, oh, I mean, the, the problem is that this looks like simple, but there are actual explanations for these things. Mm -hmm. And I think we should talk more about this stuff because, you know, it potentially moves the needle more than fixing meta descriptions or this stuff mm -hmm. because, you know, it's actually, you, you can, you can touch it. It's tangible and we can even reason about it. So, to sum up, ignoring what's behind like statistics, mathematics is dangerous when working with data because you are blind. It, mm. it, it will go well until it won't and you will hit a wall. Yeah, which is one reason why we need a specialist to actually look into the actual data. And particularly, we were um, chatting about this um, just a few days ago. Uh, in real life, actually, we are talking about how important it is these days to, to get a specialist in the TN um, with GI4, because GI4 has become even more yeah. um, um more for specialists, more for analysts rather than the general public. Um, and yeah, so, yeah. And, this, and this is the way they are actually seeing things now. And so we need, we need somebody to, to actually look into the statistical side of things, as you say, uh, so that we don't miss um, on this. And these little aspects, which you might have been seeing very uh, small, but then perhaps make a difference as well. So uh, you mentioned, Marco, earlier about... Um, uh, about um, um, statistical uh, predictions, right? Uh, forecasting. Um, so what do you think about forecasting for SEO? Is this something that you would recommend? Is this something that you do? I mean, um, usually forecasting is outside of my scope. Mm -hmm. So I only know something, but it's not my main focus. I think that good forecasting is powerful. Mm -hmm. Even simple forecast, sometimes you don't even need to do to make it complex. Sometimes simple forecasting, it's acceptable. The, the issue with forecasting is that you only need one Google update to ruin your predictions. You only need one, not two. One update is enough to ruin your predictions. So I would say that forecasting is more effective if you work in stale niches. Okay. Very stale niches where you already know from experience and if we look at the market, no one will ever outrun Q or it's very unlikely. In some B2B niches, traditional B2B niches, mm -hmm. this is common. This happens. If you do it in affiliate where every update is aimed, you know, at attacking you, it's not the best idea to do predictions. I wouldn't do them. It's very risky. The same in other competitive industries. You have to be careful because it's kind of risky. What do you call good predictions or good forecasting and bad forecasting? Okay, bad forecasting is one I saw months ago, which is like taking Google Sheets, uh, writing numbers, like predictions based on search volume from SEMrush Ahrefs, mm -hmm. conditional formatting and present it, presenting it as forecasting. Okay. That's bad forecasting. Good forecasting is using the data you have at your disposal mm -hmm. and use these forecasting models based on past data to make 
reasonable predictions and to understand, you know, a certain range of accuracy, not the exact value, a certain range. Mm -hmm. That's a very good use case. But of course, the important thing in my opinion is always communication and what you do with the data. At the end of the day, uh, you will be amazed because it's something that sounds strange to say, but even if you have seven PhDs or whatever, often the easiest, the best solution, especially in SEO, it's simple. Most of the good SEO stuff I do with data is not machine learning at all. I try to avoid it like the plague because it's <laughs> it, that's complexity, complexity, more cost, ethical risks, and so on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, usually simpler solutions like normal algorithms, scripts are more powerful for what we do and to cover a lot of use cases. Forecasting is already a little bit more complex than yeah. some of the stuff it I is. mentioned, but it's still something I was studying right now, not forecasting, not really forecasting, some tang tangential topics, mm -hmm. but in general, it's something I would recommend to do if you actually know the market and you are confident that your predictions are actually going to elicit change, going to do something, right? Mm -hmm. Something practical. Yeah, well, that's that's very, very interesting because um, a lot of us do you think that forecasts for SEO can be really powerful, but it's very difficult to get it right, as you, as you mentioned as well. I will also tell you, not only forecasts, Mm -hmm. Most of the, I mean, um, most, I mean, when I studied at college, I was mostly focused on machine learning mm -hmm. because, you know, people love this complex stuff because when you're at college, you don't know that when you actually work, you will do much easier stuff. No, you have these <laughs> high expectations, but machine learning in SEO, in my opinion, is, is really, really, really overrated because I haven't seen many cases like well, maybe not one case of success because usually it's AI or it's deep learning. It's not really machine learning. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these methods like are not really the most optimal choice compared to much simpler solutions because I told you when you create a model, you have to consider that, you know, your client has to maintain it. Mm -hmm. the, the big problem is they have to maintain it. They have to have someone Absolutely. that actually... You know, and we're not engineers. And usually an analyst or even a data scientist, is t it's not an engineer. Mm -hmm. Maybe they know something, but I wouldn't call them the same at all. And that's why I only recommend using easier methods also because they are easier to explain. I have one example, which is very stupid, but it's true. Okay. Uh, I was reading some people. Yeah, I saw some people working in banks right? Mm -hmm. Data scientists for banks or financial institutions. Mm. And most of the methods they use are the same methods that I studied in undergraduate or that around that lab. You know, basic stuff, the first methods you study, mm -hmm. which they are still powerful. Eh? But the main reason why they use them is that fast, simple. And the third reason which will make you laugh is that executives actually understand how they work. <laughs> no, because definitely. Executives always like simple things, things that can yes. be told within 30 seconds, like the green line, the famous green line and goes up. Yeah, 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 because it's true. If you have to explain a model, and that's why another reason why I think that AI is a risky tool for communication, chat GPT, not AI, more chat GPT, because a lot of people are hyped up, but then if I am an executive or a client and they ask you, ah, oh, interesting, how did you get this result? What happens in the middle? Okay, you don't know. In most cases, mm -hmm. you don't know. And that's why usually you don't like black box or similar models. You want to something more transparent where you have more control. And in SEO, we already don't have control of Google. The black box is Google. We already don't control it. No. So adding more, adding more is already too much. No, just pick simple stuff. 
But we also don't control uh, people's behavior, users' behavior. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we just don't know what is going to happen tomorrow. Or maybe we can predict it, but something might happen, something big might happen, and that might actually uh, help some business go downhill by selling some e-commerce websites, for example, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when you say when you say that um, uh, machine learning for SEO is not that um, perhaps um, suitable to use because it's too complicated. You mean using tools like ChatGPT or Jasper to to go and get schema markup, for example, or or do you mean no, something I else? Mean, no, I mean no, 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 no. I mean more complex stuff uh-huh. because Such ChatGPT as... I use daily for coding. I mean for coding is great if you yeah. know what to do. For editing, I use it every day. For schema markup, I told you I'm not super into it, but I know it makes mistakes. So I don't know much about the specific topic. By machine learning, I mean exactly some methods to predict, to predict why should I predict the number of clicks for this article uh-huh. if I already know that I need one update and it's not valid. How can also, you predict that anyway? <laughs> how can you predict how no, many you articles? Can. I mean, technically you could, mm-hmm. but the SEO industry is different from other industries only for this thing that we have Google updates. Mm. And you know they happen. It's not like in finance you have a black swan. Okay, it happens, maybe. But in SEO, you know that you have these updates. You don't know what they will do. And mm-hmm. no one can predict. Okay, you can predict that after AI content, they're going to work more or recognizing some signals. Okay, uh-huh. yeah. this you can predict. But in practice, why should I, for example, why should I use some models to model the number of clicks or impressions or this stuff, even if you do it, okay? And they tell you, okay, according to these predictions, these articles will boom or will increase. uh, Okay, but Mm -hmm. in reality, there are much better solutions that are simpler. You don't need to train any model Mm -hmm. and add more value because one of the first things you learn is that before going into the predictive route, machine learning is predictive. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You have to do. You have to go through the descriptive route, Good. which yeah. is descriptive analytics. Mm-hmm. When I usually say analytics, it's this one, which means describe events. You are not giving any predictions. You are not telling me anything about the why, the reason, but you don't even care. Does your client care why a page dropped in traffic? No, they only care about getting traffic back to that page. Unless it's a frequent mistake, they always do it, then you you tell them. Mm -hmm. But even so, do you need a statistician for it? No. It's much easier in reality. And this is a very... I mean, this idea is not even mine. Um, I mostly took it from this Cassie Kozirkov. Mm -hmm. Uh, She's quite famous. eh? She's the chief decision scientist for Google. It's a big name in the industry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of the stuff she writes, it's extremely interesting because it's not technical. Anyone can read it, literally anyone. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, it's, you know, a a little bit provocative because it tells you, it provokes you, it tells you, look, you don't need to do fancy stuff because in reality, all you care is the decision, your audience or whoever Mm -hmm. is, they are making. And this is what I like about her writing style, about what she writes, Mm -hmm. because even though she's a super technical person, of course, she doesn't barely mention you these technical topics. She just tells you, it's like reading philosophy. She just tells you, look, in reality, many businesses don't need this stuff. Many SEO clients, all they care is reporting, what's going on, what to do next, and that's it. And in most cases, it's simple stuff. The hard thing is piecing everything together, knowing the business, knowing data and all, which is very hard. But the task per se Mm -hmm. is not complex. Per se is is simple. It's it's not complex. Uh, It it is clever. It is very clever. Um, She probably knows enough to understand that the more more complexity, the worse it is for most uh, businesses, which is a good idea, actually, because you have to think about resources, time, budget, etc., etc. So, um, just to finish this conversation and uh, moving a little bit away from data, 
I would like you to share, Marco, a few books or um, movies perhaps that maybe um, help you to switch off and get away from the world of data. Something that make, maybe makes you think uh, clearer. Ma, usually, okay, I read more. Movies, I mean, yes, recently there are some good movies in the theaters. Name but three. I, it, it, I, <laughs> Yeah, but I don't like to rewatch stuff. I don't rewatch stuff. I only, I mean, I only read or watch usually once, maximum twice. Recently, I would say Spider Man was very, very good. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the last one across the Spider Man. I'm not a fan of American things. Like, I dislike them. But this one was very, 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 very good. Then, I mean, for movies, Perfect Blue, which is, I mean, it's famous. It's actually an animated movie. Japanese animated movie. And then, oof, a lot of them. I would say, well, let me see. Oh, Inception. Oh, Inception, one, that's very instance. good. But also, I mean, most most of the stuff I watch is Japanese, you know, mm -hmm. animation. And in terms of, you know, Hollywood movies, just some of the cults. Ah, Old Boy. Old Boy is also very good. Old Boy oh, uh, mm -hmm. is also very good. And in terms of book, for now, I'm not reading much, actually, because uh, I don't really have all the time in the world. Before, I was reading technical books. I'm not joking. Techn or even classical books with the Latin and Greek, mm -hmm. with the translation, because I studied them. So uh, I know I don't recall the words, of course. I don't know everything, but I still know how to read them. It's classical books. Yeah. Or, you know... Sometimes even technical books about data because so I mix between the two. Mm. The last... I, some sci-fi, sci-fi books, of course. Uh huh. Yeah, of course. Um, the last time I read Latin and Greek books uh, was in a school. Actually, I had to read those, and it yeah. was really, really interesting to, to actually see. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's that's very good. And sci-fi actually kind of uh, fits in perfectly within your your data uh, data interest, really. <laughs> I, I I mean yes yes also because they you know they are good if you want to get more creative in my opinion hmm. because the I how can I call it the slice of life stuff the mundane topics are not really creative but if you look no. for something quirky something more strange. Hmm. Maybe you get more creative. Yeah, something that kind of makes you think a bit clearer as well and maybe get more creative with your data, for example, with the SEO, uh, how to approach things in a better way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So thank you so much for your insight, Marco. It has been a pleasure. And uh, Likewise. Right. And I'll see you on the Serbs. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Bye.